let's uh, go again to spatial epidemiology. So yesterday, what we did mainly was to represent the geographical information, points of polygons, uh, we assign colors depending on the incidence, we change the, the representation of points depending on the where cases, controls. Today, we are going to start looking at uh, methods, statistical methods, to analyze, to analyze spatial data. Okay? This is the objective of this morning, the, the main one. So, uh, I'm going to cover a, a range of methods, just the, the basic ones, to analyze both uh, data uh, that are in spatial uh, point pattern and aggregated uh, data. Okay? So, um, the, 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 what we are going to cover is methods to test for spatial clustering. Yesterday we detect some, some clusters, so we are going to discuss some methods to test spatial clustering. And we are going to build as well maps that represent the variation of the risk. Yesterday we plot incidents, but today we are going to calculate incidence risk ratios and confidence intervals. Okay? So both point data and aggregated data uh, are discussed. Well, this is the structure that we will follow. I, I will start with some motivating examples. <laughs> and uh, after, we are going to go through uh, methods to analyze the spatial point process. We are going to discuss uh, some case control methods, specifically to detect spatial clustering. And in the last session, we are going to address the analysis of the aggregated data using a Poisson regression model. Hmm? <laughs> believe, it or, believe it or not, we will be before lunch. <laughs> or we will have lunch in, in between, but uh, let's see. So, this is a fair example where uh, the authors collect information about uh, leukemia cases in a region of the UK and a set of controls. Okay? What the, the authors tried to establish was whether these cases were really uh, clustered or were not clustered. Okay? So this represents leukemia cases and this is a set of ran random uh, controls. Okay? Child, children, uh, born in the same area during the same period. When you say cluster, meaning uh, the same time, same place. Mm -hmm. In this second example, we have uh, lung cancer cases and larynx cancer cases. And this uh, blue cross represents an incinerator. Okay. So the authors try to understand whether this point source was affecting the distribution of both lung and larynx cancer in this area of the UK. You need to be looking in the other areas nearby as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> this is a problem of the spatial analysis that the boundaries can affect. Mm -hmm. In this third example, what the authors uh, did was to plot the incidence risk of colorectal cancer in building. Okay? So this is a, a smooth representation of the relative risk adjusted by age and sex. So at the end, they saw that there were some areas at high risk of uh, presenting colorectal cancer. So basically, this is the type of things that we are going to do uh, this morning, okay? to analyze this point pattern uh, uh, databases and these aggregated databases. So for all these problems, we can uh, try to answer different questions. The first one can be whether the cases show a tendency to cluster together. Or does the risk of the disease vary spatially or not? Or is the disease at especially uh, is, is the risk of the disease spe specifically high in a specific location? So for all the previous questions, we can set a null hypothesis. You know? The clustering does not exist, the risk does not vary the risk is not higher in a specific location. So, but the rejection of the null hypothesis to establish a statistical difference is just the first stage. It's the 
the basic thing that we can do. In a further step, we can try to understand how this risk varies in this place. So we are going to try at least answer to this part this morning. And as an option in your in your practice, in your practice, you have as well some methods to estimate how the vary, how the risk varies in this place. <coughs> Voila. These are the motivating, motivating examples. <laughs> you know, now you all are thinking about it. It's much motivated. <laughs> and uh, we are going to start with the first problem, a real problem. Huh? So we are going to go through methods to analyze, analyze the spatial point process. Huh? So as a general definition, we can say that a point process is a countable set of points in a certain region. Okay? The, cases, the number of cases or controls in a certain region. In the jargon of spatial epidemiology, we usually call these points events to make the difference with random points in the arbitrary points in the plane. So these points, we call them events because they have a special characteristics. But it's a, it's just a, a way of uh, calling things. It's nothing important. And we are going to call NA to the number of points in this planar region A. Okay. So the analysis of the uh, point pattern focus on what is the spatial distribution of uh, these events. Hmm? In particular, there is two main points that we would like to answer when we are analyzing a special points process. Hmm? The first one is how the events are distributed to describe the distribution. And the second one is whether the points interact between them. Whether there is a relationship between them or they are really independent one to each other. What, what we call clustering is the fact that the points tend to be together. So the points interact. The, the points are closer one to each other. The existence of one point makes that another point tends to be close uh, to this previous point. Okay. So we are going to analyze methods to describe the point pattern and to check for the existence of dependencies between the points. So a first description of the point pattern can be done using the spatial density. The spatial density, in a, in a very basic way, can be defined as the proportion of observed events in each area. For instance, if we look at the uh, x-axis, we see that for each meter, we have a certain proportion of points. You know? So this line shows the density of points to different uh, distance in the x pattern. So, 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 so the x axis is the distance. So this is for for the first meter. We have ten, in the first meter we have ten percent of the point. In the second meter, meter, meter from the piece of a case. No, no. Just think in a planar region. You know, if if we have like a. In this case, an area would be one of the districts in Surrey? Yeah, for instance. Okay. But just to make it sim simpler, we are going to think in a, in a uh, quadrant. Okay? So we could think that we have a, a region that goes from 0 to 10, or from 1 to 10. This is 2, 3, and so on, meters. Okay? And here the same, from 0 to 10. So for each... Uh, well, let's, uh, for for each value of the x-axis, we are going to have a certain a certain proportion of points. You know? Point means cases. So yeah, cases. So here we are going to have in the example that I use, we have in the in the at two meters we are going to have ten percent of the cases, at three meters ten percent of the cases, at four meters. 20% of the cases, and so on. Yeah. So, but you, you reduce the area to one dimension now? Yeah, it's just for, because it's easier to visualize. But in principle, this, 
should be done, well, we will see that it should be okay. done in the two dimensions. Okay. okay. So you should, you could divide this and see the proportion of cases in each of these smaller quadrants. Okay. And next thing, in addition, is to understand this concept of spatial uh, density. So the spatial density is like the proportion of events in one axis, in the two axes, or in the whole space. There is another concept that is the spatial intensity. The spatial intensity can be defined as the number of events observed. In this case, the spatial intensity here will be 1, here 1, here it will be 2, the next it will be 4. Okay? So, actually the intensity is the number of observed events in the planar region. Okay? It's not the, the proportion. It's not the proportion. It's the actual number of observed mm -hmm. events. The, the, the count. Exactly. Yeah. So, just to make clear the difference, these two patterns show exactly the same density of events. Mm -hmm. The proportion of events in each a small quadrat is the same. Hmm? The proportion of events in each quadrat, for instance. Which is the density? Yes. Okay. If I take the two point patterns that you have there, in the first one, in the first one, we have 50% of the cases in this side and 50% of the cases in this side. In the second panel, we have 50% of the cases in this side and 50% of the cases in that side. Okay? Do you agree with me? Yeah. So here, 50% of the cases are here and 50% of the cases are in this other side. And here, we have the same. 50% of the cases are here and 50% of the cases are in this other side. So the density in these two patterns is the same. Mm -hmm. The density is the same. But the intensity is different. Here we have 100 cases per square kilometer, and here we have 50 cases per square kilometer. It's clear. It's clear. Yeah. It is, but it's difficult because that term density would seem to imply intensity too. Yeah, it, it's yeah. because I'm trying to make clear this difference because, uh, indeed, I make a mistake in the notes <laughs> and I put density in a couple of places where I should have written intensity. In density. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, checking my own notes, I, I, I made a mistake. So, it's clear that for us, these terms are quite uh, similar and are almost uh, synonyms, but in spatial epidemiology, are represent two different things, you know? So, the density, you can assimilate it as the proportion of events in different regions, and the intensity is the actual number of events in a in a planar region. And the other way around. No, no, no. Is it not, is it like Can you say the one more? The density is the proportion, and the intensity is the actual number of events. Okay. Nice. So here, as I said before, we have an intensity of one cases per the square kilometer. How we calculate this? I know that here I have one kilometer length. Here one kilometer length and I just count the number of cases. So we have an area that represents one kilometer, a square kilometer, and I know that there is 100 cases inside. Here I have the same area, hmm? one square kilometer, and I counted the event, and there is 50. There are 50 points. And just an intensity plot would on the x-axis now have kilometer square as a unit. No, kilometers. No. Still kilometers. Yeah, here it will be kilometers in the x-axis and in the y-axis uh, uh, kilometers as well. But the plot is an area that is spread is 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 expressed in square kilometers. The intensity plot would still have kilometers as a unit on its, its yes. x-axis. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't understand why you think that it should be... I, I, I'm just worried because when I see like an uh, intensity plot, I would say the count are on the y-axis 
and the x-axis would, would for me as a, would have an area measure. So I would have an area measure like count now, if, per if this is if you if you transform the three D the, the two dimensions yes. of the plane in just one dimension. But uh, Okay. Uh, it's not so straightforward. The, mm -hmm. We'll see after yeah. how it looks like an, in, an intensity plot. Okay? But we all agree that these two point, these two point patterns have the same density, mm -hmm. but different intensity. Mm -hmm. So, in summary, we can say that the intensity is proportional to the spatial density. You were saying before, both have the same density mm -hmm. and is the double the density in one pattern that in the other. So, once that we know the intensity, the density, the intensity can be calculated as a constant value that is proportional to the density of events. This is not very important. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> the important thing is that the two characteristics, the proportion of cases and the actual count of cases, are what we call first order properties of the point pattern. These first order properties are used to describe the distribution of the event in the study region. The density and the density <coughs> describe how the points are distributed in the study region. But these two values do not inform at all about whether the points are interacting between them. Whether there is attraction between the points or the points tend to spread in the space. In the space. This is measured by the second order properties. The second order properties that we will discuss later reflect the tendency of the event to be clustered, to be independent, one to each other, or to be uh, regularly spaced in between. Hmm? Okay. And you might I ask you something? Yeah. The word interaction, is that actually the word used in GIS? Because you know it's got the statistical... Yeah, it's not the statistical word, uh, interaction. It's you know the way people get... Dependency. Set, you can, you can say depend, dependency between points. The interaction is... You can assimilate the interaction in terms of spatial, in spatial epidemiology as the dependency between points. The, te the points are dependent in the way that they, to be, they tend to be clustered or they tend to be... Uh, more with higher distance one to each other, or they are just independent when they are, they are randomly uh, located in the space. So this formula allows to calculate the first order in in intensity. I mean, it's a limit, it's expressed as a limit, but indeed the meaning is very simple. It's the expected number of events in there. We calculated before very easily using an, a, a practical example, you know? In the previous example, we have 100 cases per square kilometer. So this is the uh, intensity of events in a, a specific region. The issue is that we, we could have different point patterns. We have point patterns that are homogeneous, and we have point patterns that are inhomogeneous. So in these two examples here, you see that in this first point pattern, we have the same number of events in this area that in this area. So this is what we call a homogeneous point process. All the area have, has more or less the same density of events. And the same intensity of events. In an inhomogeneous process, you see that the left part has more uh, cases, more events, than the right part. So this is what we call an inhomogeneous process. This is something important, it's quite important, because in this first example, the intensity that we call lambda is constant in the whole uh, area of interest. In the second example, the intensity varies. Hmm? Yes, the, the density might be the same between the two of the... In right the two areas it, inside it could be that the density is the same. But the, density, the intensity varies. So, for a homogeneous process, the intensity can be calculated very easily. We just need to divide the number of events by the area of the region. But in an homogeneous process, 
to provide a single value for the intensity probably doesn't make sense because it does not represent what happened in each small area. So in this example, uh, lambda and intensity value, the intensity value is different here than here. So if we provide the overall lambda as a descriptor for this point pattern, it does not describe properly our, our uh, data. Okay? So, how do you think it's that? It's like a certification, no? that you try to have a state that they are homogeneous, is the same thing for Yeah, it's like this value of the lambda of the intensity does not represent what happened in both regions. It just provides a, glo a global overview of the point pattern, but it's not the same in the left side. So here, the same lambda will describe what happened here, that will happen here. It's 100. Uh, points per, per square kilometer here and 100 points per square kilometer here. The issue is that we have uh, still 100 points per square kilometer here overall, but here we have 200 and here we have 50. So to provide a single value for this pattern, it doesn't make sense. We want really at least two, no? that we will provide an estimate of the intensity here and an estimate of the intensity here. But you can imagine that usually you have even more complex point patterns, you know? There are some areas with more intensity, some other areas with less intensity. It's rare that you have this type of process that are where the points are completely independent one to each other. So how do you think that we could estimate a more precise uh, intensity function in our point pattern? Gracia was suggesting something. For right? each, uh, you, you divide the area in uh, the single things and you can do it, otherwise you can wait for the different... Uh, so you, you suggest to divide yeah. the area in quadrants and to calculate the intensity in each of these quadrants. You know? Here we have four points, here six, here 15. So this indeed describes better our point pattern, you know? Because actually the intensity varies quite a lot. There are areas with very low intensity and there are areas with quite high intensity. <coughs> but somebody could suggest a more smart way to improve this. Somebody has a suggestion how we could... Because, I mean, it's obvious for everybody that if we move the grid, we will have a different picture, isn't it? So if we translate the grid and we set the grid starting here, instead of starting here, we are going to have a different picture of our point pattern. So you, you could make circles around each point and count how many are within the radius. Mm. No? For instance, yeah. it, it will be a similar problem. Instead of having quadrat, you will have circles. But how do you think that you could improve this uh, estimate to really represent better what happened in the state? One option can be to use a moving quadrat, you know? to smooth this estimate. Instead of considering only what is happening here, you can consider what is happening around. Mm -hmm. And to have to change this value by the average of all these quadrants. And this value by the average of all these quadrants. This will provide a smooth estimate of your intensity that probably is less affected by the grid that you use to calculate the intensity. Is this obvious for everybody? How do you do for the first one? So I mean, uh, Here right, you right have left, the, yeah. the, the H effect that for this one you have only three okay. in these four, four values for the calculation of the smooth. So here it will be an average between four, six, seven, and one. No? Here you have this seven and the, the, the value that you are going to, to represent here it will be an average of this, 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 and this. So the, the number that we will obtain are less affected, or they are less determined by the type of grid that you plot. Okay. So we can use like a moving quadrat to smooth the intensity. It will describe better the actual intensity in our point pattern. But it depends, uh, it doesn't depend on the grid so much more, but now it depends on the smoothing factor you... Exactly. That's the key point. <laughs> how, how big is the quadrant that, that you use? And we will, we will use another thing that is better than the quadrant. So, we have a very interesting function 
that is the kernel system that allows to uh, obtain an, a smooth intensity in our region. Hmm? The kernel is just a generalization of the idea of the moving quadrant. You know? For a kernel, what we are going to use is a three-dimensional function. I will show you how this is calculated. Okay? So the events are weighted in the sphere of influence of the kernel according to the distance. It's a mix between what uh, Florian was suggesting to use a cycle and instead of uh, and using a moving cycle. But the weights that you are going to provide to each point are not equal, are dependent on the distance hmm? to, the, to the selected point. I will, I will show you how it's calculated. So the kernel smoothing is a very nice tool to explore the first order properties, specifically the intensity of our point pattern. Hmm? I am going to show you how a kernel works in 2D, in a 2D, uh, two-dimensional uh, way, because it's easier to understand. Hmm? But after we will look at it in a three in, in a three-dimensional way. So this is an observed number of events in our x axis. You see, and um, we have well, even it, so the, it can be it necessary. This this can be applied as well not to um, uh, spatial variables, but to any variable. It can be here that we have h. Huh? Uh, the, 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 the H and here the whatever other variable or here we have uh, H and cholesterolemia you know so it can be applied to other other type of variables mm -hmm. so these are the points the, the blue dots represent the points the values that we have observed let's think now that these are points that we have observed in the y in the x axis okay so what, what the kernel is going to do is going to replace or calculate the value of this point based on an average of all the points of the influence of the kernel. Okay? The kernel function is going to apply to all these range of values that are the red dots here. Okay? So it's going to be an average. This value is going to be an average of all these points. Right? The yellow area. But the yellow area is the weight that we are going to provide to each point to calculate the average. So it's not a simple average, but it's a weighted average. Hmm? So for the calculation of this point, this red dot is going to have a lot of weight, this point is going to have a lot of weight, but this point here is going to have almost no influence. The red line represents the smooth estimate of the function of our data using a kernel. You see? So finally, it's a smoothing technique to provide estimates of the function that describe our data. So this is a, in a two-dimensional way, in a 2D way. Hmm? Is clear for everybody? Or should I repeat the concept? Because it's quite important. Eh? So the weight of each point is getting Smaller, the further away it is from the It's weighted, inversely, inversely weighted on, on the distance. The, far, the farther that you are, the less the weight that the... But the weight depends on the projected points. So not on another point, but on the point that I'm calculating my function. Exactly. So it doesn't exist beforehand. This, it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's, it's just a, another point in, in your region that you want to calculate. Hmm? So. This point, well, let's take the three-dimensional example. Now, you have, calculate, you have understand the way that the kernel is calculated. Or not, it's still not obvious. Just the green and the red line, but what are they? This is a, a, a parametric function, and the red line is a kernel. Hmm? This is, a, I think, that polygon okay. line with uh, Third order four, maybe? four, four, four uh, degrees of freedom. And this is just the kernel estimate. It's just to show that both parametric and non-parametric estimates can provide very similar uh, description of our table. Mm -hmm. So just to go back again, you have to understand that the value of this point will be a weighted average 
of all the points that are in the area of influence of the kernel function. And the weight of each point will be determined by this function. So here the weights will be very high. This value will have a lot of influence on the value of this point. And the points here will have a very low influence. Hmm? Those who are not in the uh, yellow area have less uh, Those influence. that are not in the yellow area, they don't count. Uh, the weight they don't count to calculate the kernel. I thought all the red points are, are counting. Yeah, because here, the... this red is just here. Yeah. So it's almost nothing. You know, this, this red dot almost does not count. Or this one almost does not count anything. But this one, the blue dot, is not taken into account to calculate the kernel yeah. for this point. But does it matter where the red points are in this area? They, it matters because the weight that you are going to provide is different depending on the distance to this specific point. Okay, so which so the, yellow, the ones that are closest to the line you count the most and the ones that are most distant from the Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and the yellow triangle should be more square then? Or why? The, the, the triangle is the function that is used to calculate the kernel. It can be Gaussian, but it can be a quadratic function, or it can be a cubic function. Depends on the type of kernel that you want to calculate. And if a red dot is inside the yellow one, how does it differ from a red dot outside the yellow? Basically, only the red dots are used to calculate the kernel estimate for this point, and the blue are not take considered. And so the, the red dots inside the yellow, how do they differ from the red dots outside the yellow? All are inside the yellow. No. no. Uh, no. Well, I, I'm not, not inside, but yes, sorry. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, but I mean this. If you project, it's like uh, this. Just, this is just the function. But oh, it's like the Gaussian. You, yeah, the, you the, should. The yeah, shape. you should consider that all these points um, is determined by these two streams. The points that are within these two streams and a distance that okay. go within these two streams are considered to calculate the, car the kernel. So from this is more the Gauss let, let, let me let, let it's me explain. It's not a triangle. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a Gaussian. Yeah. Let me explain it in a, in, a, in, a, in a simplest way. Okay. So we have there our observed point. Okay. So I'm going to calculate. I'm going to calculate the kernel. Okay. For this specific value of, of uh, my x-axis, okay? So I'm going to estimate hmm, the kernel for this specific value. What I'm going to do is to determine an area of influence for the kernel. In this case, I uh, select three, a distance of three, okay? Here, one, two, and three. So to calculate the kernel, I'm going to use all the points that are in the area of influence of the kernel. So I'm going to use this one, this one, this one, and this one. Hmm? Okay? So if this R is the y-axis and the value of this one is, um, let's say, uh, 1, this is 2, and this is 3, okay? Let's say that this is 1 as well. The value for my x the, for this value of the x-axis is going to be an average of these four points. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 1. Hmm? Divided by 4. Hmm? So it will be um, 4, uh, 7 is 1.8. Point, uh, or something like this. Hmm? Here, on this. This is if I calculate just an average. Hmm? But what the kernel does is to change mm -hmm. the weight of each value for the average. And it uses a Gaussian function. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So let's imagine that this is, for the Gaussian function, this is um, 0 0.8 and this is 0 0.2. Okay? So for those values that are really far, we are going to multiply them by a very small value. You know? It will be this one, it will be 1 multiplied by 0 0.2. This one it will be 2 multiplied by 0 0.8. This will be um, 
well, indeed, is not. I'm, I'm doing a fake example, but the whole the whole density is one. Eh? So it cannot be it cannot be more than yes. more than one. Yes. It's just to understand the, the principle. Eh? Yeah. Understand. And so on. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And we divide by the number of men. So in somehow it's a weighted average. What the kernel does. I, I was just confused by it looking like a triangle. Yeah. And yeah. I thought you, you mentioned everything inside the triangle is yeah. used no, for calculating. It's, it's, but every, it's a Gaussian everything, curve. Everything inside the area of influence yes. of the kernel. That is all this area of influence. Hmm? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is now clear for everybody? Yeah. 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 Major to minus wants to know what's the actual meaning of the y axis. So the x axis number of events, what's the y axis? Here is nothing. If you put no, it here is just a fake example that the y axis. No, 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 but uh, here, what, what could be interesting? What you can do, for what, what is, is, is to put like H that. here, H, yeah. and here the blood pressure. Okay. So you are going to calculate, and you have different values of the blood pressure for different H. Hmm? Okay. So instead of yeah, instead of estimating just a linear regression or a polynomial regression, <coughs> you can estimate a smooth function mm -hmm. that describes the blood pressure for different ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can use this kernel function to estimate a, a smooth. Okay, so it's not specific for spatial analysis. It's applied in, in yeah. plenty of other uh, no, no, uh, areas of analysis. But it's a coordinate, like x and, and y. For a special yeah. analysis, it's a three-dimensional okay. okay. function. Hmm? Is clear now for everybody? More or less, Helen? Or more still? Less. More. So if, if we go, go back to the example, each point in the region of interest is going to be the value, the intensity of each point in the region of interest is going to be calculated using a kernel function that will consider the events that are in the sphere of the influence of the kernel and the, fun the weight of each point will be determined by this kernel function. <coughs> it's clear? So in somehow the kernel allows instead of using quadrats, allows to use circles and you can apply to the circle a specific weight that can be a Gaussian function or a quadratic function or a cubic function. What we are going to use is Gaussian, full, Gaussian kernels. For, for today. Uh, no, quadratic have, kernel for today. Because in the null hypothesis we assume that there is a Gaussian distribution. Yeah, or a quadratic distribution. Mm -hmm. So, Voila, this is the how the kernel is calculated. Is more or less clear for everybody? What is the doubt, Helen? No, it isn't really. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, you don't have your brain, friend. <laughs> you know, that's it, I don't have your brain. No, but, but from my brain, I understand. But, but you, understand <laughs> that, you, you understand that we do this type of analysis quite often, you know? If you do a linear regression here, what you are going to do is to fit a curve between the uh, age and the blood pressure, let's say, and the, curve, the, the line is going to fit like this, you know? So instead of doing the, this, you can use other functions to fit uh, in your data, like, like a polynomial function of, with four degrees of freedom, or to use a uh, non-parametrical function that is the kernel. And to estimate the value of the blood pressure for each, each H value, you are going to take an average of the values for this specific H that will be weighted using this kernel function. Mm -hmm. okay. So we can do exactly the same in the space. Hmm? Each point in our planar region can be uh, the intensity of each uh, point in our planar region can be calculated using this kernel function that will consider the events that are within the kernel and this curve will define the weights of each event. Hmm? So uh, what, what is uh, your name? Derek. Uh, uh, as he mentioned before, the size of the smoother is very important because if you use a very small radius for the kernel, you are going to have almost no 
uh, an image that is no is smooth, that is not, uh, uh, that is almost your observed pattern. So if the radius is very small, you are going to have just one observation in each uh, point. If you have a radius that is very large, you are going to consider almost all the points in the planar region to calculate each value of the intensity. So you understand in a very intuitive way that this value that is called the bandwidth, when it's large, is going to smooth a lot our data, and when it's small, it's almost going to produce no smoothing in our data. So if we reduce a lot this value, we will have the same picture that our point pattern. So this is the result of a kernel uh, estimate for the example that I was using before. You see that as we uh, estimate, just counting the, count, the, the number of points, in average, we have 100 points per square kilometer. So in most of the regions, the intensity is this one, 100 cases per square kilometer. In some regions, like this one, the intensity is higher, 140, and in some regions, the intensity is smaller. It's around 60 cases per square kilometer. But in average, we have a quite homogeneous point process. There is not big variations in this range. Hmm? So, this kernel, we do it for every point in the quadrant. Yeah, it's, it's like for each, each area. pixel, for each pixel, we do calculate the, the, the kernel. Hmm? So, it's a very nice way to describe the intensity of events, because instead of providing a single value for the whole area, we are just describing in a better way what is the intensity in different areas of the granary. Okay. In this way, you will see that it is inhomogeneous in this case. I, this is quite homogeneous indeed. Homogeneous. For inhomogeneous one, you have really? much more variation mm -hmm. in, the, in, in this. But this is another thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are the, the other, other ways to test for homogeneity or inhomogeneity. This is just a descriptive tool. Eh? You're not going to, to determine homogeneity or inhomogeneity just based on the kernel. Eh? This is just to describe how the intensity varies in your uh, space. So that's all for the first order properties. <laughs> so let's calculate our kernel. Okay? So this is what we are going to do. Where's now?